You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O. Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for tuning in to the Author Stories Podcast today. You can find links to all of the shows at HankGarner.com. There's a handy uh, sidebar where with links where you can subscribe to the show any way that you like to listen to podcasts. There's a link there. It's HankGarner.com. There's more than 500 shows. Dig in and find something that you would enjoy. I'd like to tell you about some sponsors today before we get started. Author Mary Buckham has a three-book set. She's a USA Today bestseller. The Invisible Recruits, The Beginning, a three-book set. Kindle edition is on sale now for $2.99. That's three books for $2.99. Join new IR agents Alec Nosiak and Kelly McAllister as they struggle to master their newfound preternatural abilities while being thrown into a dark world of danger and intrigue. Being an invisible recruit means learn hard lessons fast or die trying. Hidden from a world unaware of magic, Alex and Kelly are members of a group of operatives known as the Invisible Recruits, the only ones willing to stand between mankind and those powerful preternatural factions, seeking to change the balance of power and gain world domination. While battling for their lives, Alex and Kelly both must deal with dangerous creatures, mysterious past, shape-shifting brothers, and more. What could possibly go wrong? Begin with the novella that started it all, Invisible Prison, to discover how Alex Nosiak first met the IR team. Then join Alex on her initial solo mission in Invisible Magic. Next, it's time to join teammate Kelly McAllister in a race to uncover secrets and stop evil growing in the heart of Africa. Mary writes stories full of grit and determination with plenty of action, but always with a sense of hope and a good dollop of romance. Get the three-book set for only $2.99, Invisible Recruits, The Beginning. A three-book set for Kindle. Also, I'd like to thank George Kramer. Uh, His new book, To Some, It's Just a Rose, is out now. Nancy Hemingway is a beautiful, wealthy heiress that has a penchant for attracting weirdos. When roses start mysteriously appearing at her doorstep, at work, and everywhere, she turns. Her friends begin disappearing. Nancy enlists her eccentric cousin, Etna, to help her figure out what's going on, only to discover that Etna isn't who she thought she was. Nothing is as it appears to be, and someone is targeting Nancy. Can she outsmart this lunatic and find her friends before it's too late? The new psychological thriller from George Kramer. To some, it's just a rose. Thank you to J.R. Hanley and Chris Winder. Their new book, Breach Team, is out now. Survival means fighting through the unknown. Corporal John Harden is a decorated soldier living in the shadow of his father, a celebrated war hero. Determined to make his own way in the galaxy, John develops a reputation as a brawler serving aboard the USS Hughes. A rescue beacon brings John and his fellow legionnaires to a cargo ship thought lost two decades ago and the heavily damaged alien vessel of an unknown species that took it down. With the brass demanding details and apparent survivors begging for aid, John's team boards the derelict ships, vowing to leave no man behind. On board, nightmares become reality as John and his team are separated and left behind, presumed to be killed in action. Assaulted on all sides by mysterious alien tech, John gets the chance to finally prove himself worth being his father's son, if he can survive the onslaught. The way home is inside and John won't back down from the fight, though a determined enemy will make him pay for every inch. Breach Team is a non-stop action thrill ride with fast-paced warfare written by two veterans. Join the fight by getting your copy today. Breach Team by J.R. Hanley and Chris Winder. Thanks for listening. Now on to our interview. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Diane Setterfield on the show with me today. She has a brand new book out called Once Upon a River, uh, that when you're hearing this, it will be available everywhere in all formats. And uh, I'm really excited about this book, Diane, the uh, the follow-up to uh, the 13th tale and Bellman in Black. Uh, Welcome to the show, Diane. 
Oh, well, thanks very much for inviting me on. Uh, Diane, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, uh, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, well, years and years and years ago, I was really small. Do you know, when I was when I was very, very young, I didn't know that stories were made by human beings. To me, I believed that they must be natural phenomena like... Um, like storms or mountains or earthquakes. It didn't seem possible to me that something so fantastic could have been made by a human being. So I think it was the day I realized that human beings made stories was the day I decided there couldn't be anything more amazing than that. So as a as a child, it was my ambition to write. It was just that by the time I was a teenager, I'd become quite sensible and realistic. And by then I thought, no, people like me don't become authors. So I, I scaled back my ambitions at that stage. And it took me several decades to, um, took me several decades to come back round to the idea that it might be worth trying. I've talked to several people, Diane, that uh, that have had that uh, a similar experience to that. The mm. the awakening uh, that uh, of the realization that books were made by people, and mm. and and yeah, a lot of people have that uh, this almost magical reverence uh, for books that they've just they must just appear from from the fairy world or something because That's they're just right. so That's they're right. just so <laughs> magnificent, you know. Um, but yeah, that, and I think that, that goes, uh, to, uh, to descriptions that people tell about stories a lot. You know, this, uh, this book was magical. It transported me to another place. Uh, mm. like there's, there's something very specific about books, uh, that seem to have this captivation, uh, that, that really no other art form is able to do. Uh, it, it's really fascinating to hear so many people speak like that. Mm. Well, it's, to my mind, the reason why it works so powerfully in that way is because of the fact that it's collaborative. So every time I finish a book, I obviously I, tr I write it to the very best of my ability and I write the best book that I can possibly write. But I'm always a bit disappointed with it when I've finished it. And the reason for that, I've come to understand, is because a book isn't really a book until someone else reads it. And it's when two minds come together that the magic happens. And when you've written a book, you can't really see the magic yourself because you're conscious of it as a made, created thing. And it's the mind of that second person that comes to it, the reader, that's what triggers the, or brings that alchemical uh, reaction that creates something absolutely magnificent. Um, and so it's, it's the fact that it's very much the product of two minds that, um, that gives it that really special quality two imaginations at work together on the same material that creates something astonishing and alchemy really is the way to think of it it's when when something that is becomes something else and and i, I love that analogy thank you yeah it's yeah well that's i i it took me a long time to understand that that's how it works I remember when I finished writing The Thirteenth Tale being rather surprised at how much everybody else liked it because I thought, well, you know, is it is it is it really so good? Because when I look at it, all I could see were the times when I thought, well, I could have done it that way or I could have done it this way and I did it this way, but maybe I should have done it the other way. And all I could see was you know, that series of decisions that the author needs to take and revisiting them in my mind. Did I do it the right way? Was there a better way? Um, and it's almost impossible for the author to 
uh, well, it is impossible, I believe, for the author themselves to have any sense of what it's like to come to this story as a reader, which is why I'm always so fascinated at hearing other people's reactions to the book. Um, you said earlier that uh, that it was uh, you know, a couple of decades before you came back around to, uh, to believing that, that you had um, the gift and, and could do this. Uh, mm. what, what were you doing in those intervening couple of decades? I was spending an awful lot of time reading, which, of course, is the perfect apprenticeship. <laughs> that is. <laughs> um, and I read for pleasure, but I also had... Uh, I'd also made decisions educationally and professionally that put me in a place where reading was something I was being paid to do. So I studied literature. I studied, became a specialist in French literature, and I then taught French literature. So I spent lots of time. I spent lots of time studying the same books, reading the same books over and over and over again in order to be able to write about them and in order to be able to teach them to others. And it gave me, those years gave me a very useful uh, sense of what, what it, the, the very different ways different readers will respond to the same material. So when you're teaching a certain book and you have a class of 20 or 30 young people who are reading it together, it, you have that, it gives you the very useful experience of knowing that a single story can be interpreted in so many different ways. A single incident in the book, a, sing, a single word in the book will be read in so many different ways by so many different people. So those years in the classroom were re really valuable to me as a writer. I don't regret them at all. There is no, never a day when I wish I'd come to writing earlier. I'm always happy that I took the path I took. And I, I think there's something really, um, really special about uh, waiting and gaining experience that can only be gained uh, but through living life and and not to say that there aren't brilliant books written by young writers there absolutely are and, and this is this is uh not to discredit them in any way um but i know from my experience there there were just certain stories that i could only i was only able to tell uh because i had i, I had seen a few things and i'd experienced a few mm. things and i'd i'd have some some love and 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 loss and you know all of the things that that make up uh, a life and uh, I, I think that sometimes it's just necessary for, for writers. I'm, I 90% I want to agree with you. <laughs> There's part of me that would like to be able to subscribe wholeheartedly to what you've said. It's just that Carson McCullough's The Heart is a Lonely Hunter is one of my favorite novels. Yes. In all the years since I read it, it has never not been in my top three favorite novels. And to think that she wrote, started writing that when I think she was about 19. Right. And it was published when she was 21 or 22. So it does seem to me that there are people in the world who have a wisdom beyond their years. Yes. And I guess also her life wasn't easy and that, she there wasn't there wasn't a lot that protect that insulated her some of us lead childhoods which are maybe more insulated than others some of us by the time we're in our late teens have experienced an awful lot and certainly have enough to be able to start on there and then i for myself i'm conscious that when i'm writing i'm always drawing on material from my earliest years. I think my childhood, although at the time I was living it, I thought, oh, no one has a life more boring than mine. But actually, when I look back now, I can see that I'm constantly drawing on experiences from my very early years, but they do need to be f filtered through uh, a mind that has got more experience and the one thing that I really 
do genuinely believe is that the, the ability to craft your material only comes when you've had years and years and years of reading and that I think is the most valuable thing that those decades brought me is that I read and I read and I read and that gave me my craft. Absolutely. Um, uh, all of that reading, Diane, uh, what what were your favorite uh, kinds of stories to read? Was there a certain genre uh, uh, that really appealed to you? Do you know when I was when I was very young, a book was a book. I I was omnivorous and I simply read whatever came to hand. I didn't grow up in a household where there were lots and lots of books already. Um, both my parents had left school at 15. They both loved reading, but they weren't highly educated and they didn't have uh, very much money. So books were very valued, but they weren't very numerous. So I used to go to the library, which I loved. Bookstore visits were very special treats. But in my family, I had a very large extended family, and the girls used to just pass bags of books around to each other. And a lot of them were what I think my teachers would have thought were quite poor quality books. Lots of trashy romances, but I... I didn't really distinguish between one kind of book and another. So I would move from a science fiction story to some trashy romance. Of the books I was borrowing from the library, I was equally, um, I, I, I was, I, I think the books from the library, I just wandered rather randomly between the children's and the adult section. I think I'd read most of Dostoevsky by the time I was 12 and I didn't really know that it was a great classic <laughs> to me I was just reading these really weird books by this guy with a Russian name um, and I didn't tell anyone what I was reading I just read and I read and I read I read whatever came to hand and so amongst it there were amazing great classics but there was also an awful lot of real throwaway literature um it didn't seem to matter to me i just had a brain that was hungry for story and i think maybe the way i write now which uh, there are people who find that in terms of my style they like the certain literary quality to what i write but they also enjoy the 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 more commercial page turning quality of you know a big plot and a big mystery and sometimes I think well perhaps that came out of my childhood reading I've never it's never seemed to me that just because you're writing a story with an exciting plot that that means that you might write it in a way that's less careful and less poetic and less beautiful than you would if it was a more literary novel so to me those two things sit together very naturally um, Diane, let's let's talk about your uh, your first novel, The Thirteenth Tale, and uh, the the breakout success of that book. Uh, w was that the first novel that you attempted to write? Before I wrote that novel, I had started to write a novel. I'd thought that I might like to write a crime novel, and I'd written ten or twelve thousand words of a crime novel, but I discovered that I had no, I was only really interested in the psychology. And when it came to the, how the police work, I just wasn't really interested in having to find out all that stuff. Now, it's not that it would have been difficult to find out because one of my close neighbors at the time was a senior policeman. And so I had someone right on hand, two doors away, who would have been willing to explain everything I needed to know in a very informal way. Um, so it would have been easy to find out. I just really couldn't motivate myself to be interested. So at that stage, I thought, well, 
writing this kind of crime novel is is not for me because as soon as the police come into the come into it I tend to lose interest so I thought that's not the answer and I put it to one side and pulled out of my drawer a few paragraphs that I'd written rather out of the blue a few months previously and I looked through those and I thought well I wonder if I could do something with this and that those paragraphs turned into the letter that Miss Winter writes to Margaret at the very beginning of the book and that opens up the mystery and sets the action um, moving. And, and that book became uh, very different from a uh, you know, modern police procedural. Uh, you know, the, the first idea that you might have have had uh, did so that. Do you remember writing those uh, those first thoughts down that then became the letter? Uh, what was the, the original impetus for that? Yes, I do. I do. I'd been to the cinema and I'd seen a film based on a novel by Patricia Highsmith, one of the Ripley, one of her Ripley novels. And I'd, I'd read all of the Patricia Highsmith Ripley series, absolutely adored them. You know, the idea of this, um, of this very suave, um, mysterious man who lives a double life. Everyone thinks he's a, everyone thinks that he's a rather reclusive international businessman when the truth is he's an assassin. And I found that the notion of a double life really interesting. And when I'd got to the end of reading the series of Patricia Highsmith books, I was really frustrated because I wanted one more. And it wasn't just that I wanted another Ripley story. It was that I wanted a very a very specific story about Ripley because I believed that in inside a person, the ability to maintain a double life would be reduced over time. And that as a person grew old and became frailer, and became more aware of their own mortality, they would find it harder to maintain such a pretense. Because when you become aware of your mortality and you realize that you're going to die, I think the main consolation that we reach for is that we will be remembered. But if no one knows who you really are, you won't be remembered. So my feeling was that old age and frailty would jeopardize the existence of this double life. And I wanted to see that character struggle with the urge to tell the truth before it was too late. And seeing the film had reminded me very acutely of how I felt about that Ripley novel, that it, I was so devastated that Patricia Highsmith had never written it. So then I thought, well... If I want to read that book so much, then maybe I have to write it because Patricia Highsmith hasn't and won't. So um, I thought, well, I don't actually want to take her character. That would that wouldn't be that would be a false thing to do. So I need to explore this material with a different kind of character. So I remember walking home from the cinema and it was still light and stopping and sitting on a park bench and just scribbling down very quickly these few paragraphs and coming home and putting them into my desk drawer thinking one day, who knows, I might do something with that. And then when I abandoned the police procedural, coming back to those those paragraphs and thinking, right, I'll do something with this instead. The uh, the thirteenth tale is full of uh, characters that uh, are larger than life, and uh, not only the characters but the the place and the setting. Uh, Angelfield House is a uh, is a character uh, of itself in the book, and and then you then be- below all of that we have the the threads of subterfuge and the threads of mystery and. Uh, and this this really eerie feeling that just permeates the whole thing um, did, were were those uh, were those things intentional in the writing 
and and how did the characters uh, come to you? Well, the, those things were intentional. I had a very strong sense from quite early on of the atmosphere that I wanted to evoke. And I wanted to, you know, the kinds of books I love the most are the ones where the reader is so drawn in and the creation of this other world and other characters is so compelling and so convincing that you forget all about your own life so that when you do emerge from a session of reading you're almost surprised that to find yourself in your reality because this other reality has seemed so powerful and so real to you so yes i was i was intending to to do that the characters came to me actually very differently um margaret was the hardest character to write because she's oh excuse me someone's sorry sorry that was housekeeping Um, that's okay margaret was the hardest character to write because she is at the beginning of the book and in fact through most of the book she is such a reserved person and she keeps herself on the inside she doesn't give very much away and so it was it was very difficult to find a way of writing her that would make the reader warm to her and love her and be on her side. Uh, and that took, at the end, I remember at the end of the first draft thinking, well, you know, I've got a good story here and I've got some compelling mysterious elements and I think I've got a good setting and I've got some great scenes but one of my two key characters simply does not come to life on the page. I've chosen to write a character who is reserved and I need to find a way of opening up this character more than I have so far. So when I rewrote the book, I made huge changes in the way I wrote Margaret. And in fact, I think first time through, I'd written Margaret in the third person as she all the time. And I changed that to turn it into a first person narrative so that it was Margaret herself telling the story, which would enable the reader to step into Margaret's shoes and understand her, all the things about Margaret that make her reluctant to um, to show herself too much to the world out of fear of her own vulnerability, and by doing that, that that did seem to work much better. Um, other characters in the book came rather instantly. Um, Hester, the governess, she she sprang onto the page fully fledged and she was an absolute delight to write it was so it was so wonderful having a character who the moment the scene started she just ran away with it and all i had to do really was um run afterwards writing as fast as i could to keep up with her so i guess in the end that kind of balanced it out margaret was very slow to write slow to um, to appear fully fledged on the page but on the other hand Hester was a felt like a miraculous gift to a writer um, this book went on uh, when it was published to be a, a pretty massive success uh, kind of a, a number one it New was. York Times uh, bestseller a, as someone who was a lover of books and a lover of stories uh, it, when this book came out and it was so well received uh, what did that mean to you as as someone that has loved books and stories for so long I I was just overjoyed I was I was so happy you know all the while I was writing the book, I had memories of a certain book that I read when I was a teenager. And it was my sister who found it first. She took it from out of the school library. She came home and I got home from school on a Friday. She was already sitting reading it one Friday night and I could see 
from the look on her face that she was in another world. She was enthralled. She was absolutely spellbound. And I was so desperate to get this book off her. I can remember thinking, when mum calls us to go down to dinner, she'll put the book down and I'll be able to get it then. But she took it to dinner with her and sat on it all through the meal so I couldn't get it. <laughs> so so I that was even more evidence that she was reading something really good. Well, she didn't finish it till Sunday morning. I picked it up on Sunday morning and started reading it then. Well, it was Wilkie Collins, so 19th century novel um, of suspense. It was, my goodness, that book, it took possession of me. It absolutely transported me, swept me away. I could not stop reading that book. And what I think was most heartwarming for me was the fact that after I'd written The Thirteenth Tale, everywhere I went, readers would come to me and they would tell me little stories about reading The Thirteenth Tale and how it had swept them away and how they'd forgotten to do really important things and how they had um, wriggled out of doing things they were supposed to do. I can remember one day a man came to a signing in Chicago and he said to me, well, I had to come and find out about you and find out about this book, he said, because he said, he said last week, he said, one of my employees phoned up and said, she couldn't come to work. And I said, oh, dear, I'm sorry to hear you're sick. And she said, oh, I'm not sick. I'm reading a book. She said, it's so good. I can't come to work today. And he said then she did come to work when she'd finished the book and she lent it to someone else. And then that worker phoned me up and said, I can't come to work because I haven't finished the book. So he said, so here I am. I've come to find out what it's all about. And that just reminded me so much of the experience of reading Wilkie Collins when I was a teenager. And I thought what a great boss he was, that he obviously understands how important reading is. I wish all bosses were the same. Um, but yeah, it's just, I think when you love reading, what you want is to be able to give other people the pleasure you get when you read those books that really, really enthrall you. So knowing that what I've done has been able to give other people that kind of experience is it's just wonderful. It just makes me it makes me really happy and, and when I hear things like that then I know I'm doing the right job. Uh what when having a book that is so massive and so successful and loved by so many people, um what it, what is it like to follow up something like that and uh and then to to approach the blank page again and and think oh goodness uh you know how do i top that um well i don't know that i ever thought i needed to top that um That's great. i think that i think that people often talk about the you know the curse of the second book and i I do understand what they mean insofar as um, outside my workroom, you know, people talk to me about, you know, the next book and you do have a sense of expectation and people waiting. But when, when I'm actually at work, when I'm at my desk, there is no 13th tale. There is no, you know, previous book. There's only me and today's book. There's only me and today's scene. And I think writing as a process is so... Um, produce, producing writing um, takes all of your brain. So when you're actually doing the writing... Um, there's simply nowhere in your head for even a tiny little thought about other people's expectations to to take root because the the new book, the new characters, the scenes, the language, the problems that you're having to resolve in order to bring a story to life 
simply take up every 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 inch of mind space that you have there's just no room to think of of a single other thing you know you don't remember that you're hungry you don't remember that you're supposed to phone your mum because it's her birthday you you know you're forgetful of everything except the new book that you're bringing to life so I suppose in a way that that's probably very helpful that it's that way because that's what stops you being I think be from being overwhelmed by the sense of other people's expectation and and that really is the only healthy way to approach it isn't it the the work mm. today is the and the characters that that I'm living with now uh, yeah. are, are, are just as important, just as alive as anything I've ever done. And you have to live in that space, don't you? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, t- let's talk about the new book. Uh, you've got a brand new book uh, that's uh, when people are hearing this, uh, it, it's out available now. Um, we actually recorded this a couple of months ago, uh, but the book is called Once Upon a River. Uh, tell us about this book, Diane. Uh, where do we find ourselves and who are the characters that we meet? Well, this is a story about a river. It's about a little community of people who live close to the river. And it's um, it's set around uh, a riverside inn in the days well, well, well before television and where the locals gather in the evenings after their hard days at work and they tell stories. And one night, the innkeeper himself has started to tell a story he opens his mouth and he pronounces the words once upon a time and then the door opens and a stranger turns up and it's no ordinary stranger he's injured he's bleeding he's soaked in river water there's plainly been some terrible accident and in his arms he's holding the dead body of a drowned child. So they immediately send someone running for the local nurse and the stranger collapses on a, and they put him on a table. The nurse comes to uh, check him out and to stitch his injuries. And then the nurse goes to look at the drowned body of this little child and she does all the usual checks that you make and the child's not breathing and the child has no pulse and her skin is white 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 and her pupils are dilated so there's no doubt about the fact that this little girl is dead and then as she's standing there trying to figure out what might have happened to bring about this set of circumstances she feels one pulse and she says to herself but that's not possible and she stands there for another minute and she feels it again and the child who was drowned um, an hour later lives again and that's the beginning of the story I I absolutely love that. Uh, it, it's very reminiscent, uh, uh, to me of some stories that Neil Gaiman uh, has written where. Oh, I'm a big fan of Neil Gaiman. Oh, well, Mm. yeah. Uh, it, it's these, uh, this, um, mundane world where odd things seem to happen and the, Mm. there's this, this intersection of the real and the, uh, super real and the, uh, the supernatural and the little things going on that just, uh, make you question the things around mm-hmm. you. Um, so not only do we know that you're a, a, a big fan of, of mystery and kind of the, uh, the, the, the way people will beguile and, uh, the, you know, the things that we do to each other. But what, what is your fascination with, uh, these, uh, kind of stories that are, uh, while not necessarily supernatural, definitely play with that and, uh, and uh, kind of challenge the way we see things and think about things? Well, I can certainly tell you 
where my fascination grew from in relation to the the supernatural element in this book and that is that I grew up with a very sick uh, little sister when I was four and my sister was two she was diagnosed with quite serious heart condition so I think at a time when most children are actually still full of the belief in their own immortality um, I became quite aware from quite an early age that there was such a thing as death um, and that actually it could come close to you it could come it could come painfully close to you into your own family and we lived um, we lived a life for quite a few years of constant hospital visits and um, and and uh, vigilance now as it turned out uh, my sister survived and lives a very full and happy and rich life and I love her to bits so we had a happy ending but I think that those years of trying in my very childish way to understand what this death thing meant uh, that certainly predisposed me to thinking about certain things so when when I read in a in a newspaper when I was about eight or nine about a little American boy who had drowned in a cold lake and an hour later came back to life I can remember thinking well this is okay we don't need to, maybe we don't need to worry about Mandy so much because um, you know if people die they can come back and I said to my grandmother look you know look at this story if Mandy dies she can come back and my grandmother said no 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 Diane I I don't think I don't think you should believe this this can't be true and for years I lived with the this kind of fascination um, that I'd read this thing in the newspaper and newspapers told the truth but my grandmother who to my mind was a woman who knew everything um, she had told me it wasn't true so what was I to believe was it true that a drowned person could come back to life or wasn't it and of course about a decade later by which time my sister was out of danger um, I actually discovered the science behind it all and learned that there is a very 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 mysterious totally scientific phenomenon by which certain people will fall into very very cold water and appear to be dead and in fact not be and one of those instances where science is every bit as magical as magic <laughs> and, and really quite miraculous and I think that that little snippet of knowledge went really deep in me because of this experience I'd had of growing up in a family where we did feel very vulnerable and we did fear that we might suffer a terrible loss. So I think that is the germ of it for me. That was that was the the beginning point of these reflections and these years of thinking about um, the possibility of someone being able to return from the dead isn't it exciting when when just a germ just the the smallest fragment of an idea blossoms into this big story that uh that can resonate on such an emotional level it is it is and i think that what's what's interesting to me is that at the time i was probably in my 20s by the time i understood what the science was um, and at that time I wasn't a writer I wasn't planning to be a writer but when I look back now I think I definitely had the mind of a writer because I read that story um, I when, when I when I found out the full science I read it carefully 
I committed it to memory and I put that away somewhere very, 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 um, I, I, I put that away somewhere where I couldn't forget it. Uh, and I knew that one day I was going to do something with that. And it still took another few decades before I got around to bringing it out and thinking this is, this is the next story. But it had been there waiting all that time. And it's, um, so this goes back to what we were saying earlier about our, about, um, the experience you need in order to be a writer and what does your childhood give you and what does the passing of the decades bring you as a writer. But I think in this instance, I can trace this particular story back to all these stages in my life from that little girl of four trying to understand what dying meant through to becoming a reader and reading these little snippets in newspapers first without the science the first story presented it as a kind of a magical mysterious miracle the second story a decade later presented it with the science and um gradually 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 piecing these things together knowing that it was going to have a value for me it was going to be important for me in some way even though i didn't yet know what that was until finally, um, finally there was Once Upon a River. I absolutely love that story, Diane, and uh, the the idea uh, of where this book came from uh, makes it even more meaningful for me. Um, if if people are just learning about you and your work, and uh, uh, God forbid that they've n- never heard of, uh, of your first novel or, or uh, your second and now your third, um, where can people find you online maybe to uh, dig into your back catalog, connect with what's going on with you, and uh, and and uh, to learn more about you? Well, I have, um, I have a Facebook page, and I'm on Twitter, and I have a website, dianesetterfield.com. Excellent. Uh, we're going to send everybody to uh, to see you and to pick up a copy of Once Upon a River. Uh, when you're hearing this interview, it's out everywhere now. Uh, Diane, it's been such a joy to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Hank, it's been lovely talking to you. Thanks very much for inviting me. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. You can find archives of all of the shows at hankgarner.com. And when you're there, please subscribe. Up next is an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. The ancient building wore the severe cassock colors of a Puritan minister, a uniform monochrome of slate gray shingles and soot gray clabberts. Its shadowed upper windows crosshatched like the facets of a spider's eye. The second story protruded beyond the first and bore the house's only ornament, two gray teardrops of wood, weeping from each corner of the building's stiff upper lip. The place would have looked sinister and foreboding in its shadowed alley if not for the die-cut silhouette of a dancing sheep, jaunty above the door, and the two front bay windows that blazed with colorful, welcoming light. The windows were hung with orbs of colored glass on staggered lengths of ribbon. Each orb glowed with autumnal reds and delicate greens, burgundy tints and pumpkin hues, dappled raspberry and clover lime, streaked with light and weightless as bubbles over a cauldron. The shelves below offered crystal skulls and silver daggers and horny devils, Celtic chalices and woven dream catchers in dreamcoat hues. A primitive broom leaned in a corner, ready for flight, and a rhapsodic nude in bronze clutched her goat-legged lover beneath a jackal bust of Anubis. The interior of the shop was even witchier. Above a crude and sooty fireplace, A stack of brick barely holding the shape of a chimney pushed through the barn-high roof, threading ancient beams that crisscrossed overhead. Brooms and kettles and Christmas lights dangled from these, alongside Halloween costumes and Chinese umbrellas, pointy hats and bundles of herbs. Jason wandered deeper into the shop. His fingers trailed across strange bronze statuary and Aztec masks of turquoise and lapis lazuli. He rolled his eyes at the luck candles and money charms, 
but goggled indecently at a nude and anatomically correct silver nymph with long golden hair that reminded him of Kate. See anything you like? Jason jumped, turned, and jumped again. The woman standing before him was the living embodiment of every hippy-dippy counterculture type he'd ever seen. Her hair was green, her face pale and round, her doughy body wrapped in some elaborately woven ethnic garb. Her eyebrows were black and pierced in little rows, and her eyes were heavily circled with midnight blue, as if she'd been sucker punched by an oil slick. She tapped the glass over the nymph. Admiring the goddess, I see. Oh, uh, um, she'd practically caught him with porn. You want to hold her? She won't break. Here. The woman flipped open a glass door and handed Jason the naked figure. See how heavy she is? You could bang her against the wall all day and barely make a dent. She waggled her eyebrows, obviously enjoying his discomfort. He checked the price tag. Seven hundred bucks? The goddess is a symbol of love and fertility. Don't be ashamed of desiring her. The woman's long green fingernails plucked a long black cigarette from a long red case, and she lit it. I sense, she blew smoke and studied its whirls. Dissatisfaction in love? Yes, I have just the thing. She pulled Jason into a side room where the smell of her clove smoke gave way to the skunky aromas of potpourri sachets, tea leaves, and hanging clutches of twiggy flowers. She searched, found a little bundle, and pressed it into his hand. This will make you irresistible. Rub it on your nethers twice a day, and love shall surely find you. Jason made a face. The bundle smelled like cow manure. He didn't even want that on his hands. <laughs>